So welcome back to part three of our third read repair videos where we are undertaking uh, a wider project on this uh, 18th century three train fusee driven clock. If you watched the introduction you'll have heard me talking about this component which is uh, an air brake in clocks it's called the fly or a governor if you like and um, it has these uh, added on pieces, little tabs, some weights and an extra spring. The fly is uh, out of poise, as in it's not particularly well balanced. And the spring, which is there to uh, make resistance or a clutch between the fly and the arbor, is both too strong. And it has an, this little piece added, which I'm just about to uh, remove. So in action the clock uh, isn't working properly. The striking or the quarter striking uh, bounces when it's locked and that energy should be dissipated in part by uh, the slipping action of this component. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get um, those added on pieces off. They're glued on and so I pop the whole thing in acetone and leave that overnight. We then turn our attention to the arbor or the axle and you can see here that it's kind of bouncing backwards and forwards when the train runs. So all axles or arbors in clockwork need axial movement. Uh, in engineering this is called end float and in clock making it's called end shake. And for a clock like this typically that's about a quarter of a millimetre, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Um, here I'm checking the mesh of the two gears, uh, what we call the depthing, because it's obvious from the get-go that the hole or the bearing that this component rotates in is either worn or damaged um, that we'll see in a short while. And so I'm checking that the center distance between the driving wheel, the brass one you can see on the left here, and the driven gear, the pinion on the right, are correct. So you can see this uh, excessive end shake and the fact that the pivot wobbles in the hole. Now for a train wheel, a regular gear wheel, that's not necessarily um, a particularly bad thing, but here we can see it's causing uh, a problem when the fly runs because it's relatively high frequency, I guess. So it's looking like we need to reduce the amount of float or end shake. We need to tighten up that bearing by a process called bushing. And thirdly, we need to extend the pivot because generally the pivot, the bearing, should come to the outside of the frame. So it should be at kind of the width of the plate. And you can see here it's short and wobbling around in the hole. So, um, yeah, three parts to this process. Extend the arbor, put a new pivot on, rebush the hole. So first I measure between the plates. I could just take a reference from the plates themselves, which in fact is what I do later on. But it's just kind of interesting as an exercise to see uh, what the difference is. As I said, typically we'd be looking at about a quarter of a millimetre, give or take. The plates of this clock, 200 years old, are quite organic. Um, but we can see that the measurement between the plates is about 54.2 millimeters, whereas the distance across shoulders of the arbor is about 53.65. So it's not massively uh, out, if you like. Um, however, it would be useful if that arbor was about half a millimeter longer. We can see the pivot here. Looks okay, but it's um, it's short and a little bit tapered, although I won't get too excited about that. So the next thing to do is to let down that pivot. That is to um, anneal it or soften it slightly. It's just going to make it a lot easier to work. And I do that in a spirit lamp flame 
and heat the uh, pivot and the end of the arbor until it turns blue. The blue is only an indication of it uh, achieving a certain temperature where the pivot should have annealed or tempered enough, sorry, to make it uh, more workable. So I set the arbor or the axle up in the watchmaker's lathe and uh, I, I could cut the pivot off with uh, a graver or cutting tool but actually it's just easier to file it, it doesn't take long. So once I've filed the end of the arbor flat I then take a three-sided uh, tungsten carbide um, engraving tool actually um, and what we call find the centre which is just to locate a little pip in the centre so we can begin drilling and it's done concentrically. In larger work you could use a centre or slocum drill. So I'm going to drill using tungsten carbide you could use a high speed steel uh, drill here. I'm just lubricating the work with a bit of turpentine spirit but it drills easily uh, the carbide is great, although it um, is brittle, so you don't want it to break off in the hole. Once the arbor is drilled, I take the same pyramid cutting tool and turn a little undercut on the face of the work. So when the extension is fitted, the two pieces come together very neatly, kind of shoulder to shoulder. I'm going to make the extension out of blued pivot steel. Now blued pivot steel is a material that's specifically made for the watch and clock industry. So it's uh, carbon steel that is already hardened and tempered so we can work with it uh, straight out of the box if you like. Uh, you could use a high carbon steel like silver steel which would be really great but you'd have to go through the process of hardening and tempering in it. Um, as a, another uh, part of the operation. So blue pivot steel is just convenient. So I take a bit of steel that's slightly over diameter for the arbor and I begin by turning a cone shape on the end and I turn it to a taper so I can get a reference by using the hole uh, for what diameter we actually want. Once I've established that I begin to um, decrease the angle of the taper until we have a near parallel spigot which is going to fit our hole really well we hope and once it gets to the point where I'm happy with the fit then I begin to use an abrasive stone in this case it's an Arkansas stone just to get that kind of final finish with the insert stoned again so we get to the point where I think I can just tap in the extension I use the graver to form another undercut for exactly the same reason so the two components come together really well so I measure and cut off a little bit over length this is called parting off Once we have our um, extension, I tap it into the hole. You could use a bit of stud lock in there as well. Um, there are other sort of uh, old school ways of doing this, but um, as long as it's a really good fit, it won't um, it won't go anywhere. Once the two pieces are together, I use a pivot file to bring the extension down to just over diameter. If I can help it, I don't really want to finish too much on the arbor. And then I check by using the frame and our value we took before for length and begin to form the, uh, the pivot. You can see straight away that the new pivot is much longer than the old one. It's actually over length and we're going to cut it down once it's pretty much to diameter. So I continue the operation of turning and trying and then shorten the pivot and with an abrasive stone and then a ceramic stone I bring it down to a reasonable kind of polished finish and round the end. 
the last part of this operation is to bevel the shoulder so the amount of material that rubs on the inside of the plate is reduced. So I try the uh, new pivot in the hole and we are left with uh, fitting a new bush into that hole to uh, re effectively replace both parts of the bearing. So back to our uh, fly vein which has been soaking in the acetone as you can see uh, the parts just come um, loose, they added on or glued on pieces. So the fly spring to begin with is really strong. The fly spring needs to be sort of compliant in order to provide friction. If it's strong like this, what you tend to get is a situation where it's too strong and there isn't enough slip between the two components or it's not rubbing at all and not causing any friction and um, and and the fly just spins on the arbor and the train runs too quickly. So although this spring seems to have been here quite a long time, I'm actually going to replace it with one that's uh, thinner and more compliant. But before that, I'm going to fill in um, those gaps and the cutaway pieces on the edge of the fly and the rounded corners. So. Slightly controversially here, um, I would normally use new material, but I had an old clock plate. don't know where it came from, and I want to be clear that I wouldn't advocate using old components to uh, repair things, only because it might serve as an encouragement to begin to disassemble clocks for their parts. So I felt a little bit uneasy about this, so I saw and file inserts that are a reasonable fit for all the gaps and uh, bits that are being cut away. Now the fly has to have um, notches cut out of it to clear the pallets which were later. Um, I think they've been moved up in the clock because of a, li a larger escape wheel. So probably when the fly was uh, original um, it had smaller cutouts and it's quite usual to see a fly with a cutout for an escape wheel or something but um, these are just too big and we want to kind of maximize the amount of air resistance of course it would uh, maybe be easy just to make a completely new fly but um, however I thought it would be a useful exercise in silver soldering so I pin everything down and use a borax based flux to um, as, a, as a flux between the new and old components and I use a relatively low melting point silver solder so this is a hard solder uh, some people call this silver brazing and I braze in the six new pieces of material Once the brazing is finished, I put the work in a bit of uh, caustic soda to get the flux off because it sets to a very kind of vitreous and hard surface. And then we begin the uh, kind of long process of cutting off the excess and then filing down flat again. As I said earlier, it's arguable whether it would have been a lot easier, I'm sure it would have been easier, um, to just begin with a new piece of material but in a way uh, the principle of course is to preserve as much of the clock as possible however in this case I think it was probably borderline so with an amount of filing and tidying the whole thing up we now are back to one reasonably coherent uh, piece of material so the next thing to do is to make and fit a new fly spring so, but before we do that, the arbor has been recut. The fly spring's been moved in the past, pre presumably because of the later escape wheel. And I just want to recut this notch a bit because it's kind of squidgy, and I want the fly spring to be a really good, sort of tight fit in there. <laughs> to make the spring, I'm going to use CZ108 brass, which is um, a good material for these kind of cold working operations where you want to make a spring. <laughs> 
as opposed to a sort of high leaded brass which would be easier to work but wouldn't make a particularly good spring. And we make it springy by hammer hardening the material. Once the hammering is done I file out all the hammer marks, cut the piece of brass, file the piece of brass to a taper and find the point at which it's a really good fit in the notch in the arbor. From there I drill and pin it with a piece of brass wire checking that the friction is what I'm looking for and then rivet the pin and the final part of the operation which I don't seem to have filmed is cutting that spring to length and I'm going to cut it the whole width of the of the fly and here we see the new or repaired fly and repivoted arbor in operation and what you uh, and you can see that at the end of every striking operation the fly stops in a different position which tells me that it's slipping on the arbor as it should and the bouncing of the striking train has been massively reduced so thanks for watching we'll be back soon with the next uh, installment of this um, pretty sort of major intervention and as always please like and subscribe and leave your comments below bye for now